Hi, I'm Darren, the photo buyer at London Drugs, and today I have Jay. Now, Jay is our Nikon rep, but what is your full title, Jay? Oh, man, okay, so it's the Technical Sales and Nikon Professional Services Representative, Western Canada Consumer Products Division. Wow, you've got a really long business card. Yes, now, we're I do. really happy to have you back. We had you for the launch of the D850, an exciting camera, but for today's video, we're going to talk about uh, cameras for the rest of us. Yep. Maybe not, uh, maybe not quite D850 level, but we're talking like D3400, D5600. How how can I get the best use out of those cameras? Right. And I want you today to uh, show us what, what you think we should do. Sure. Well, I, I, I mean, you know, over the holidays, London Drug sells hundreds, if not thousands, of entry-level DSLRs to your customers. Lots of cameras. And, you know, that initial rush of excitement when you get the camera home, you charge the battery, you put the lens on it for, for the first time, you go mm -hmm. out, you take some pictures, and then you have a week of rain and you kind of put the camera away, and maybe some of the shine of having that brand new camera's a little bit lost and you you, you forget to pick it back Especially up Especially we've had such a cold winter, you might not be excited to get out there right, right. away and use it. So what I want to do today is kind of give people some settings ideas, uh, some setup they can do to their camera ideas to get them back out and taking pictures again and being successful at it. So that's everyone, why we're here. Everyone wants to take better pictures, right? And right. that's why they bought a DSLR, because they want better pictures. Now I know you're from Nikon and this is about Nikon cameras, but a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are just general rules of photography. So even if you've got a different brand of camera, the these fundamentals rules, apply. They still apply. Okay. Yeah, the so fundamentals. How apply. do we want to get started today? Okay. Well, basically, I think the first thing is uh, when a lot of people get the camera home, they see a pile of dials and buttons. They see a screen on the back of the camera and lots of buttons. Maybe just a little tour of like what actually the switches and whatnot on the camera actually do. Right. So, um, I, you know, I think the the very first thing we all want to know, and each manufacturer is a little different, but where do we turn the camera on? That's important. Super important, but even more important, you cannot turn the camera on without having the battery. On most cameras, the battery door will be located in the bottom of the camera. Right. Um, we will always include a charger with the, with the cameras, but basically here, we've got the camera switched on. Um, the very next thing people want to do and know how to do is take a picture. And right yeah. here is your shutter button. That's okay. as quick as that to take a picture. So charge your battery, put it in, turn it on. And you're taking pictures already. It's that quick. It is that quick. Now. But we want to get better than that. Exactly. And so the magic of getting better is this little dial on top of the camera. And this is called the mode dial. The mode dial, okay. Okay, so the mode dial basically tells the camera how we're going to tell it to shoot pictures. Okay. And um, you'll see a lot of symbols and a lot of letters on the mode dial, and we'll get into what a lot of those mean later on. What do I set it at to take good pictures? Uh, there are many different settings to I take know. good pictures. Uh, the most important one, if you have something like a D3400 and you're just getting started, is actually our guide mode, and we'll actually dive right into that a little bit later on. So that's on. like a built-in J that helps tells you how to use your camera. I have a better personality, but yes, oh, guide right. mode guide mode is definitely a built-in J to get All right, I like that. Okay, so, I mean, on the front side of the camera, really, the shutter button is the main thing that you need to worry about. Right. Um, but when we look at the back of the camera, um, we have this beautiful LCD display on the back. So once right. you've taken your picture, you actually get to review what you took a picture of and make sure that it was in focus and it was exposed. Right. And that's as simple on almost every camera is pressing that little playback button on the back. Okay. Um, most of your menu, conveniently located under the menu right. button. Um, on the D3400, you see, you'll see this little question mark, and that yeah. question mark is a built-in owner's manual for the camera. Okay, so it's like built-in, if you want to refer to something, hit the question mark. And it'll tell you what you need to do to actually operate that function. Really, really nice and intuitive. Very, very good. So that would be really the long and short of the buttons that I want to show you for now. Okay. The only really important thing that a lot of people seem to have trouble with when they first get their camera home is actually mounting the lens. Yeah, how do you put a lens uh, on or off on this camera? Right, so the lens release button is located right here okay. on the front panel of the camera. Um, on every Nikon, on the side of the lens, there's a little white dot, and on the side of the front of the camera body, there's also a little white dot. So you line up the two white dots and then twist it counterclockwise to and feel you hear that click. click. The click, you hear it? You're ready to go. Yep. So that's basically everything you need to know to get started taking pictures. All right. Charge battery, turn it on, and your shutter button. Okay. Okay. Now they talk about the command dial. Are we going to get into that? We are going to get into okay. that. Okay. So we'll tell where we're going to set that command dial to. Right. Now what I kind of wanted to dive into is a little bit, um, when you get your camera home, um, 
you'll get it usually with, I guess you could say, like your kit lens. Yeah. Uh, generally, most of the entry level Nikons will come with an 18 to 55. 18 kit, being wide angle. Wide angle. And 55 being a little bit more telephoto. And right. that's what you use to kind of get started. Right. So in it's your a little zoom. Basically a little zoom. Right. Everything from nice, big, expansive landscapes to you can shoot portraits with your 18 sure. to 55. Now I'm going to throw to the screen here and we're going to we're going to put these slides up so you can see. So you can actually see the difference between 18 millimeter. Then you zoom that 18 all the way into 55. Right. And what the scene you're seeing in front of you is actually across the river valley in Edmonton, Alberta. Okay. Okay. Then you've reached the limit of your 18 to 55, and maybe you want to get a little bit more in on your subject. Perhaps your subject's a little like bit bring distant. things closer. Right. So London Drugs and they sell dual lens kits. Right. Where you get a telephoto as well as your kit lens. Right. So the next few slides show what happens when you attach a telephoto to your camera. Again, bringing things even closer. Into 100 millimeter, then 200 millimeter, and wow. finally at 300 millimeter, you see wow. this beautiful picture of the Fairmont Hotel located across wow. the River Valley in Edmonton, and right. you can see how far it brings your subject in. Right. I get a lot of times people say, I take pictures of things, and everything looks so far away. Right. And that's because they're shooting wide angle. Right. But if they add a telephoto lens, they can bring those distant subjects up close. Right. Um, the, it's, it's not a perfect rule. It's not a perfect rule, but Basically, if you think the human eye basically sees at about 35 millimeters. Okay. So when you think of your lens at 35, that's kind of what you're seeing in front of you. And as you go to 300 millimeter, that's basically like nine times of zoom. Okay. So that would be like nine times closer. Nine times closer. That would be makes like sense. using a nice pair of binoculars type right. thing. Which so Nikon also makes. Nikon also makes beautiful binoculars. <laughs> but on the side of every lens, I'm going to put the uh, camera body down here. Okay. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about some fundamentals of photography. And this is about any type of camera, not just Nikon. Any type of camera. Okay. This is not just Nikon, although we love that you have Nikon. Right. Okay, so on the side of every lens, you're going to see a series of numbers. Yes. And that series of numbers will generally be something that relates to the focal length. So in this case, we have an AFP 70 to 300. Now, 7300 is basically what we call like the magnification or the view. Basically, it's the magnification or the, the view of the camera. And then the next series of numbers, you're going to see digits here of 4.5 to 6.3. Do you have to do math? You don't need to do any math. Well, that's good. Yeah, what this basically means is it's the physical aperture of your lens. Right. Now, apertures, it's a techie camera term that basically means the opening in the front of your lens that actually lets light in right. to hit the sensor. Right, so when we talk about aperture, I have a great slide that'll show the difference between right. a lens that's more closed, which we call stop down, mm -hmm. and so more the higher the number, the more it stops down. Totally counterintuitive. You right. would think a big number means a big opening, when in this case, a small number means a big opening. Gotcha. So it works in reverse of kind of what we think it might work like. So an f 1.8 lens, like the 50 millimeter f 1.8 I have in my hands here. This is a lens that can go to a very, very wide aperture. Right, so the smaller the number, wider opening. So it's kind of like golf. The slower number is actually a better score. It's a better score, right. absolutely. Now, um, sort of a general example here we'll throw up on the screen just to kind of show folks what happens when you open your lens up. That smaller number, sometimes when you look at professional portraits, you have this beautiful in in focus subject, right. and the background's really nice Love and those blurry. portraits. Yeah, the, it's the way the pros shoot. And, an inexpensive $250 lens can give you that result. But what you have to do with that lens is open it up. Open it wide open. To its maximum aperture or its right. maximum opening. So in the case of this one, that would be f1.8. Right. Right? So a great way to get professional looking results without spending a professional amount of money on gear. That's what people call the bokeh effect, right? Right. Where the right. background's out of focus and your main subject is in focus. Right. And Those on, the, great. on the example on screen right now, there's this beautiful barn owl hanging out on nice. a roost that's shot at a very wide open aperture and the barn owl is in perfect focus. Right. And all the busy trees and everything behind it are nice and blurred right. out. So all the focus the, is the on the background. The background can be distracting sometimes. Right. And you, or sometimes you can't be in a great spot to get a perfect picture. So by opening the lens up, your subject's in focus and your background, all that distracting thing is all blurred and it's right. not in the... Not a, not Right. View. And you okay. still have the option, like in the next example, where if you wanted to stop that lens right down to a big number, like say f11 or f16, where you get front to back focus. So lots of things in focus. Right. So in the example that we have on screen right now, it's it's this 10 to 20 millimeter lens on the front of the D3400 shot right. at f16. Right. So the things at the very front of the frame are in equal focus to everything at the very back of the frame, which is super useful for landscapes. Right. Because you want a sharp picture. You want everything to be in focus. Right. 
And you can do that with portraits as well. Right. But we shall continue. Um, the next major factor, and I, I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people struggle with shutter speed. Right, because there's cameras can go down to very slow to very very fast. Where do I? Where should I be for right. these pictures? Right. So any most cameras anywhere from thirty seconds right. up to and including one eight thousandth. That's fast. Of a second. That is blazing fast. Right. So the example we're showing on screen right now is the same waterfall. Right. shot at two different speeds. And at one-tenth of a second, you get that beautiful blurry water effect. Right. right? You always see those pictures on screensavers of computers where the water looks all f flowing and beautiful. Right. And that's done with a slow exposure. A very slow shutter speed. Slow sh and yeah. then if you're looking to freeze action, say you were at uh, uh, the example on screen right now, I was at a beach in Hawaii and there were gi gigantic crashing waves and I wanted to freeze the action of that like, wave. Like freeze the water, literally. Literally, and so for that, I would use a shutter speed starting at say like 1 2 50th of a second. But if I know we have lots of customers who would use a telephoto lens to go take pictures of birds. Right. And my general sort of rule of thumb for shooting birds is I want to be at 1 3200th of a second. 1 3200th? That's pretty fast. The reason for that is, is as the birds flying through the sky, their wings are moving way faster than the actual animal, and right. that'll ensure that the wingtips are as sharp as the face of the bird. Okay, so definitely when you're filming anything action, you wanna freeze it, you need that high shutter speed. You wanna go as much as you can for a higher shutter speed, okay. absolutely. Um, then the third aspect of it, so we've covered aperture, the physical opening. Right, we've covered, opening and closing the lens, how yeah. much light it comes in. We've covered shutter speed, which is either we want to we want to have a nice flowing water look, or we want to freeze action in front so of us. So it's how fast the shutter opens or closes. Yep. Okay. The last thing that we will need to talk about is ISO rating. Okay. Um, ISO doesn't really stand for anything at all. It's okay. just what the camera companies have used to rate what the Back camera in, is doing to collect light. In the film days, you used to call that ASA, right? ASA, correct. Right. Yeah. So now, basically, in digital world, it's digital amplification. Okay. is the easiest way to describe it. All right. It's the way your camera actually boosts the amount of light that's come through the aperture and hit the sensor. Right. Okay? So with ISO rating, in the example that, uh, that we have up on screen right now, it's actually a low ISO, which would surprise people for shooting right. fireworks. Because most people think if it's dark, you want to boost the ISO to make it brighter. Right. And that's not always the case. Okay. Um, anybody watching, grab a uh, piece of paper and a pen right now because if you're ever going to shoot fireworks I'm going to give you the magic formula. Oh, yeah. Canada Day's coming up. Canada Day's coming. I want you to use F11, I want you to set your shutter speed for five seconds and set your ISO to 200 and I promise you you will rock out firework shots every single time. Okay. It is one of the only formulas in photography let's that's slow, absolute. Let's slow that down. Okay. Shutter speed of 250? Uh, five seconds. Five seconds, so it's a slow shutter speed. Yeah, you need a tripod for this. Okay, there we go. That's what I said. You need Thank a tripod. You. So we have to have a tripod when you're shooting fireworks. Yep. Set it for five seconds. Yep. Our ISO was to set to 200. 200. And our aperture? F11. F11. So we're closing it down, giving us a great depth of field. Yep, great depth of field, and it enables you to shoot that longer shutter speed as well. Right. One of the things that goes with ISO aperture and shutter speed are that the three are interrelated. Right. As you change They affect one, each other. They all have to affect each other. So very, very, very... Now yeah. I'm going to ask a question. Why would we want such a low ISO in a dark situation? Because isn't you if it being dark, wouldn't we want the ISO to be higher? It honestly depends on your end goal and the end result that you're seeking to capture. Say for instance, like if I'm going out to shoot the Milky Way, um, the Milky Way is actually quite faint in the sky. Right. And even though I will have to use a long exposure to get the Milky Way, I'm gonna have to boost that ISO rating right. to actually let the camera collect enough light to have that beautiful Milky Way picture. Sure. It really depends. Okay. When I say that the only absolute in photography literally is fireworks, I mean it. Okay. Yeah. So that's everything it. else depends. Got you. Got that written down. Stay with those, and you'll get the best firework shots ever. Yeah, you're ready for Canada Day. Okay. Okay. So I remember how we talked about the mode dial. Right. Earlier. All those, all those icons and letters. Right. Where do we go? So on a D3400, if you're just getting started, I am going to completely suggest that you use guide mode. Guide mode. That's the built-in J. That's the built-in J. Okay. Um, guide mode basically allows you to shoot any subject completely correctly. Okay. Um, so once we put it in guide mode, I'm just gonna flip the camera body around here so we can zoom in on the screen. And you can see that we have four main fields on the back of the screen. We have a shoot, 
We can view and delete our photographs. We right. can actually do some digital retouching to our photographs. Built in. Built in, and nice. we can do a camera setup. And what I'd like to do is actually shoot. And you'll see here we have easy operation and advanced operation. Right. Use advanced, even if you're just getting started. Even if you're a beginner. Yep, use advanced because wow. advanced still takes you through the entire process, but gives you just a little bit more creative control. Okay. It doesn't make it harder, it just gives you a little bit more creative control. Okay, that's control. good to know. So will you say advanced operation, and now, basically on the back, uh, I'm gonna flip this to you quickly and then we'll go okay. back. You see how it says show water flowing. Yes. How we talked about before. So if we wanna soften that waterfall or soften that stream, we get to actually tell the camera what we want it to do. So I don't necessarily have to know, like fireworks, so you told me what the best shutter speed aperture combination was. I don't have to know that for every situation. The guide mode knows the best shutter speed aperture combination for that Exactly, for that and the guide mode asks you, how do you want to do it? Do you want to right. make the water sharp? Like in that wave right. example that we showed, or do you want to make the water look like it's flowing, like in that waterfall example? Right. So from this screen, it's nice and easy. We can just say up and down and left and right. And if, as we go left and right, the picture, the example picture in guide mode changes to show you what's going to happen. Oh, that's good. So it because really Because you can't always be everywhere all the time to help everyone. No. So that's built into the camera. If I could clone me, I that would, be, would. be great. But I can't clone me. So. Not yet. No. So or, guide mode has done a okay. great job of it for us. So that would be the, that would be the first mode that okay. I would go to. So and don't be afraid of the advanced mode. Don't be afraid of it. Go right there. If you're going to guide mode, use advanced okay, operation. Okay, we got it. Um, so that would be the first thing that I would use on a D3400. The next is on every single manufacturer's camera bodies, there's going to be four letters. There's okay. There's going to be an M, mm -hmm. an A, yeah. an S, yes. and a P. P is for professional, right? P is not for professional. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about what the different modes are. There, of okay. course, is green square or auto mode. Right. Um, and auto mode gives the camera all the control. All um, right. So with auto mode, you basically point at your subject and you shoot, yeah. but you have no creative control. Okay. What the camera is gonna try to do is just make sure that it gets the shot. So it gets a picture. It gets a picture. Okay. And I think when people start working with their cameras, they wanna have a little fun and they wanna right. try some creative well, That's things. all you bought a DSLR, right? Right, right. You're not using your iPhone, you're using a beautiful DSLR. Right. So, manual mode, this is the one that requires you take your mode dial and you turn it to M. To, this to is the M. one that requires you to have the most photography knowledge. Okay. And if you're not totally comfortable in manual mode, right. it's something that you want to eventually get comfortable with. Okay. Because it gives you the most creative control over right. your photography. Because now you're controlling everything. Right. My favorite one next to green square mode, if I'm just getting started or I'm showing people who are just getting started out, is you take your mode dial and you set it to P. Okay. Which is close to auto. Right. It's called program mode. Yeah. So the camera does what it does in auto. It gets a picture. Okay. But you have the ability to take over control okay. of your camera. So in green, so green mode and P mode are similar, but the difference is in green mode, the camera takes care of everything. In P mode, the camera's still an automatic, so to speak, but you can adjust certain things. You can override things to okay. take a little bit more creative okay. control over your photography. So it's like dipping your toes into it a little bit. Correct. Gotcha. The next one is called aperture priority mode. Okay. Uh, we talked I, about aperture before. Yeah, we did. That's how much light we let in to the correct to the sensor. so in aperture priority mode basically what I'm doing for the camera is I'm setting the physical aperture and the camera will select ISO and shutter speed for me okay so with each of these modes I'm picking one parameter and the camera right. is determining the other two parameters right where I like aperture priority mode is where if I want to take a nice portrait of a subject right I can set that nice f 1.8 like we talked about with before. the backgrounds out of focus with the backgrounds out of focus. picture yeah and the camera will make the decision surrounding ISO and shutter speed for me. Right. But it still gives me that ability to take creative control. Right. So the camera's smart. It knows you're taking a picture, but it doesn't know, do you want everything in focus or just one part in focus? Right. By turning it to aperture priority, you're telling, hey, I just want that main subject to be in focus, not the background. Right, right. Gotcha. And again, if we stop down to like a bigger F number, F11, F16, we'll get more front to back focus. Gotcha, gotcha. Right? And then last but not least, and this is for the uh, the soccer and sports families out sure. there. Sure. This is shutter priority mode. Okay. Okay, so in shutter priority mode, you set the shutter speed that you'd like to shoot at. Remember the example of the birds. Right. One thirty-two hundredth. Fast, fast, fast. I set the shutter speed, and the camera makes the rest of the decisions to make sure that that shutter speed will work. Okay, so I'm at my kid's soccer game. Yep. 
I bought my telephoto lens because yep. I want to bring the, the kids up closer playing yep. the game and I'm in shutter priority. What shutter speed should I be at? It really, again, it's not like fireworks. It depends. Right. My depends on the light, right? Depends on the light. Depends on, uh, for instance, my nephew's nine years old and they are fast. <laughs> fast, fast. I don't have that kind of energy. Generally, when I'm shooting one of their games, I'm at about 1 12 50th all the way up to maybe 1 2,000th. Okay. And I'm comfortable there. And then when you take a picture, you can instantly review it on the LCD screen. You right. get a sense of it's, if it's fast enough. If it's fast enough, if it's too slow, um, you get instant feedback that we never right. used to get from film. Right. We had to wait days right. to, to find, find out, out that we messed up that shot. Not anymore. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing that I would encourage anybody to do is digital memory, the memory cards that actually go into these cameras right. are so inexpensive now. And I want you to make a lot of mistakes. I make tons of mistakes every day and I know what I'm doing. But if, you, if you're just getting started, you're not costing yourself any money. Right. All you have to do is reformat that card and, and try over. again. Yeah. It, um, now we should get though uh, a speed rated memory card though. Something that, that uh, especially if we're gonna shoot any video on some of the cameras, something like uh, that's gonna have, and also if we're doing the sports where we're doing a lot of fast action, the camera's buffer can get slowed down. So having a faster memory card means it'll just, could take more pictures and spending, rapid succession. You know, spending a little bit more makes a huge sure. difference. Sure, it'll actually prove the point. It's almost like, it's almost like premium gas for your sports car. Right. It's gonna give you a little extra performance. Right, well and especially like, um, you know, somebody had asked me recently about shooting video and they said, you know, I'm shooting video with my DSLR and all I'm doing with that video is uploading it to Facebook. That's it. Right. Do I need to shoot at the highest quality? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Okay. Always shoot at the highest quality you can possibly have. So even you're just taking stuff that you put on the internet, which doesn't necessarily require high resolution or high uh, bit rates, you should always still record it at the best quality. At the best quality that okay. the camera is capable of, mainly because whatever online platform you are going to upload right. it to is going to compress it for you. Okay. So give them a better beginning result, right. and you'll get a better end result. If you give them a so-so beginning result, it's just going to be showing that uh, lower quality. Exactly. So get, shoot the best possible quality, and then let the uh, the site up convert it or change it, or whatever you need to, whatever. Whatever for, the site does. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. Whatever the site does. So on the example on screen, we talked a little bit about doing portraiture. Right. With a kit lens. Everyone likes to take portraits. Yeah, and I think a lot of people they get their 18 to 55, and if they buy the dual kit, they get the telephoto, and mm -hmm. they're happy with both right. lenses. Covers them wide to telephoto. Right. Covers them from 18 almost all the way out to 300, right. and they wonder, okay, what's the best focal length? maybe to take a portrait on. That's a great question. It is an awesome question. So if you're on your 18 to 55, I don't recommend that you take a portrait any wider, any smaller of a number than 35 millimeter. Right, okay. So your 18 to 55, try to have it at 55. Right. right? If you're on your telephoto, pretty much almost anywhere through the range okay. will make a better portrait. Right. Wide angle is not that flattering for a portrait. Not at all. And okay. I need all the flattery I can get in a portrait. Okay. On the example you'll see on screen right now, it, this is actually a portrait shot with a, with a 18 to 55 kit okay. lens. And you can see that the subject, as well as the front to the back of the image, are in focus. Right. Right? And what you really want, even the next example, you can see how the background behind yeah, the subject is a little bit blurry, a little bit there. A little bit softened. Yeah. And that's on a 35 millimeter. Wow. That's our inexpensive. But that's a, that's a nicer picture. Yeah, that's a much yeah. better picture. That's yeah. our little 35 millimeter f1.8. Great. It's a $260 lens, and it's right. a great next so purchase. Getting those high speed lenses, those fast lenses, don't actually have to be expensive always. Not at all. Not like right. I said, the, the 518, this is. I think one of your best sellers, certainly right. one of our best sellers. Right. This is the next lens that almost every camera buyer right. has. Right. Um, there's kind of a, I guess you could say in the industry, like a term called the nifty 50. Right, right. Right? And yeah. everybody ends up getting a 518 at some point. Once you, if you've shot with a kit lens and then you switch over to a prime lens, what they also call prime lenses, you notice that the, the range you have with those lenses, especially getting those beautiful background out of focus, and your subject looks amazing, yeah. you think, wow, this is really, really good. And actually, it makes you a better photographer, I think. It absolutely does. Well, and then the whole thing with it, with no zoom, you have to zoom with your feet. Right. Um, I'm lazy, I don't normally like zooming with my feet, but when I'm walking around with the prime lens, like in the next example we'll put it's up worth on the screen, this is shot with a 28 millimeter, but a very, very fast lens. And wow. you can see that my subject is perfectly in focus and the background almost disappears. Right. Now this is a very, very high-end lens in the Nikon lineup, right. and I'm fortunate to be able to use it, right. but it is, it's one of those things that 
you know, you Because you wouldn't normally use a wide angle lens for doing a portrait, but because of the quality of this lens. Breaking yeah. my own rule. Right. Right? Remember how and it's okay it to break the, it, It's okay to break the rules once in a while. Yeah. No, I break the rules every day. Yes. I know yeah. that. Um, and then the, the next one. Now, this is an example of using a faster lens, stop down. Okay. Just a bit. Stop down. What does that mean? So that means I took the F number and instead of being 1.8, I made it f5.6. Okay. So I went a little way down because we've talked yeah. about the extremes. So you've closed it down. Just a little yeah. because I wanted to make sure that my subject was front to back in focus. Right. And I wanted to show a little bit of the environment that my subject right. was in as opposed to making it all really blurry. Right. In you the get background. a kind of a sense of a, the scene more. You right. Know, so you get a little bit more of the, in the picture. And I shot this in aperture priority. Okay. Right? So I set the aperture for 5.6 and the camera made the rest of the decisions based on what it saw in the scene in front right, of it. Right, right. Right? So, you know, it's it's okay to give the camera some control. And I'm, right. I'm quite frequently That's doing that. That's a great that. shot. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, we talk about we have our DSLR right. and we bought it, we bought our dual lens kit. Yes. And we're off and running. And, you know, the number one question I get asked when I go places is what's next? What yeah. do I need? Yeah. Like what's gonna make me a better photographer? What's gonna be the next pieces of gear that yeah, yeah. that you know I need to think about getting? Well, one we've already mentioned, the the fifty one eight. Getting a prime lens. Get a prime lens, and this will really do worlds to right. to to make you really think and improve your photography. Right. Um, great for those portraits with the background out of focus, yeah, blurred like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Bokeh effect. But number two, I think everybody should invest in a good quality carrying bag. You want to protect your investment. Oh, you do. You do. I'm clumsy, <laughs> and I like to have everything padded quite well. Right. If the moment strikes, I, I often, if I'm holding the bag in my hand, the bag just gets dropped. Right. Because I need to use both hands to quickly swing up and take that picture. Sure. So you want to have a nice padded case. Um, That's imp important. Yeah, and lots of companies make great, great, yeah. great cases. We have got a great selection of drugs. Yep. In store and then online. Yep. Yeah. Um, number two. Uh, one of the more frustrating things that can happen is if you're going on a longer trip and uh, and you don't remember, say, to take a battery charger along with you. That would be... Is having a spare battery. That is a great, great option. Yeah. Because these cameras don't take double A's. You can't run to London Drugs and just buy some batteries no, to put that in there. But you can you run to London Drugs and pick up a spare Nikon battery. Right. But you have to charge it up. You do. Right. We sell so, chargers. Too. We do sell chargers. So I always have an extra battery, with, especially going out for an extended period of time. Right. You don't want to be taking these great shots and your camera go dead. Right. Extra battery, easy, easy thing to now get. Now the D3400 gets 1,200 shots per That's charge. That's a lot. But you would be surprised when you reignite your passion for taking pictures, how fast you can get through 1,200 pictures. Some people don't take 1,200 pictures a year. I, they should. <laughs> I know they should. I can do that in an hour. I know you can. If I need to. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, you know, filters for the front of your lens. Um, now how, there's different types of filters. Right, and you you buy all the filters for I London drugs. I do. I and do. what would be the first thing you would recommend for somebody to put on the well, front of a lens? The very thing, the basic one thing you want to get is a protecting filter. Right. Because filters are relatively inexpensive. Yeah. You know, any from twenty to forty dollars, depending on the size. And if the filter gets dirty or scratched, I've seen people where they've gotten rock chips, replace that inexpensive filter and then protect it in the, their, their lens because right. the lens you're gonna keep for a very long time. Right. And the filters always, and sometimes if you're not careful, sometimes you're in a rush and you put your camera back quickly and you forget to put the cap on, knowing that lens, uh, that, that filters on there will help protect that lens. Right. And there's also things like polarizers, yep. neutral density filters you can use for, and you can get into colored filters. Well, we'll save that for another video. Yep. But the basic thing is getting a good standard clear filter to protect the lens. Right. That's a must have. Yeah. And if you happen to buy a lens, like in the example of the 10 to 20 that I have in, on the 3400 right here, if you have a lens that has a lens hood. Yeah, that's a hood right there. Please always leave your hood on your lens. Um, I go many, many places and I'll see the, the lens hood actually turned around on the lens like this and it's basically doing nothing. There's no protection. Why do we need a lens hood? Um, a lens hood serves two purposes. One, of course, uh, much like a filter, it's protecting the front element of your camera. Okay. But two, in the case of a really wide lens like this, um, if we're shooting and we have the sun anywhere in front of us, sure. Uh, when you get a sun hitting the sun hitting your lens at a certain angle, you get what's called a lens flare, and right. it washes out your picture. 
So these are specially designed. So, so it's almost like a baseball cap. It just kind of comes out a bit to kind of shade your eyes. It comes out a bit just to, to shade the lens. Shade the lens to make sure that you have nothing unwanted, no weird artifacts in your pictures. So now, should I take that off when I'm inside? I leave mine on all the time. And okay. the reason I leave mine on all the time is, again, because I mentioned I'm clumsy. If I didn't have this hood on or if it right. was turned around and I dropped this and it hit the floor flat, there is a chance that I could shatter the front element of my lens. Right. Especially if I didn't have a filter on it. Right. Right. But a lens hood is much less inexpensive to replace. Yes. A lens hood, forty to sixty dollars. A front element, anywhere between three hundred to two thousand dollars. Depending on the lens, of course. Right. Of course. Right. So, so use your lens hood. Always use your lens hood. Okay. Um, so a couple other things maybe to cover about uh, about our, our most of our DSLRs. Um, Nikon has a, a free application. It's available on iOS and the and the Google Play Store. Okay. It's called SnapBridge. Right. Okay, so SnapBridge allows a Bluetooth connection between your camera and your smart device. Okay. That allows you to pull down smaller size versions of the photos that you take. So I can now take pictures, even if I shot it in high res, mm -hmm. using the app and this Bluetooth connection, I can even use those to send a, a, a lower or a, a lower res version yep. that's easier to post on Facebook or Instagram, or whatever, and I can use that to upload to my phone? Correct. Yeah, it goes okay. directly to the camera roll on your phone. The app okay. will ask you permission, and you say yes. And basically, you can set it one of two ways. You can set it on the as you shoot paradigm. Right. Um, so every time you take a picture, it goes directly from your phone, or sorry, from the Cam camera to your phone, every single frame. Okay. Or you can set it so you can manually, each time you want to upload a picture, you can manually mark that picture. So you just pick out your favorites if you want. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Um, because 1,200 shots, can right. fill up a 16 gigabyte phone. I imagine really quickly. In a hurry. Right. Yes, as I've learned. <laughs> yes. By forgetting yes. to turn off that setting. Right. So again, I'm forgetful. Right. So uh, SnapBridge exists on the D3400, the 5600, the 7500, the D850, the right. D500. So most of our lines support SnapBridge. The whole idea is you got a great camera. You're out there taking pictures. You want to share those pictures. Correct. And the whole idea of now using that SnapBridge app is now you can get them onto your phone or your smart device, whatever you're using, and you can share them quickly. Right. Um, and just a, a word of note for for the users as well. Um, make sure that iOS, anyways, on the Apple side, is updated to 11.2.6. Um, it fixed an Apple issue regarding connection right. of third-party Bluetooth devices. As, as we know, phones, products, they get continually improved and updated with app updates. Right. And since this uh, SnapBridge came out, there's been multiple updates as well. So if you are using it, make sure you've got the latest version of SnapBridge and the latest version on your smart device. And the latest firmware on your camera as well. Right. Um, now most of those are downloadable and there is actually an LD's Extras, an LD Extras Extra right. that allows you to get free firmware updates at London Drug Stores. That's right. That's a great Great and thing to have. Yeah, so a, just a, a great way to make sure that everything is always working all the time. We can't always control Apple's updates, but we can definitely control our right, own. right, right. So I stay up to date. Right, and then last but not least, we have this uh, we have this free software, and it's free for anybody, whether you're a Nikon user or not. Well, that's nice. I know we we wow, that's so generous of you. We guys. are very generous. It's called Nikon Image Space. Okay. Okay, so Nikon Image Space is basically a cloud-based online storage for your photos. Okay. So as you take the photos and you upload them to the SnapBridge app, right. you can make a separate connection to Nikon Image Space where it'll go into SnapBridge and then right up to the cloud. So it's kind of a, like a safety backup. A safety backup completely. Now okay. if you're not a Nikon user, you get two gigabytes of storage. Okay. If you are a Nikon user and you take the serial number that's located on the bottom of your camera okay. and you register it within the software, you get 20 gigabytes. Wow, that's really good. Very, very generous. That can hold a of lot of photos. And if you're doing SnapBridge uploads, it's unlimited. SnapBridge really? does not count against your storage limit. Wow. So a great online place, and it's a beautiful looking gallery. It's a great way to keep your photos safe. But a lot of people about the camera don't even know that they have that. They probably don't even know that that wow. exists. That's a great thing. So there's, uh, I mean, you know, that's. That's basically the, the main point of what I wanted to make sure that I shared today is just, you know, a, just a couple of settings things, a couple settings ideas to actually get out there and start taking some pictures again. 
Yeah, huh. no, that's excellent. You know, I really appreciate going over all the functions and then back to, to accessories. One thing we did want to talk about is also a tripod. Yes. If you're taking those fireworks shots, you do need a tripod. Yes. And one thing I have to also say, you're talking about holding, getting your camera ready, a sling strap is another great idea. If you don't have a sling strap, you should get one because you're always ready to take those photos really quickly the, you know the camera's hanging at your side and you swing it up and you're shooting in no time at exactly all. and the yeah. thing is it's obviously your DSLR is not like a phone it can't fit in your pockets so has a little bit of space but having rather than having a camera just hang around your neck here and now hangs at your side so it's out of the way and you can enjoy your holidays or vacation whatever you're doing and then when you need it you slide it up take a picture and you're good to go yeah absolutely so, this camera, the, the 3400, we know is a, kind of a starter setup. Then we go up to the 5600. Right. has a few more features, has a swivel screen, uh, a little bit more video features, I yep. believe, as, as well. Uh, any of these cameras, though, again, we talked about today, the, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, that goes for any type of camera. Not even just Nikon. Every brand, exactly. every, it's the fundamentals of photography. And, you know, as a, a popular question, the number one question I get when I'm out interacting with the public is, hey Jay, I just bought, insert model here, let's say sure. I just bought a D7200. Sure. And it came with the 18 to 140 kit lens, that's what right. I bought with it. Right. What's my next lens? Great question. So the question I always ask in return to that is, what do you want to shoot? Right. And I'll always get a pretty clear answer. I want to make better portraits of my grandkids. I want to go shoot wildlife. Um, my son and daughter play organized soccer and I want to get better shots of them on the field. So there's no one answer for that. Um, just kind of my one answer would be rest assured that there is a lens in the Nikon ecosystem. Right, you've got a huge selection of lenses. A giant selection yes. of lenses. Um, but say for somebody with a D7200 that was a really passionate birder and wanted to go out and say go to the, like locally here, say go to Boundary Bay for pictures sure. of owls or the rifle bird sanctuary. Sure. The lens that I would recommend is our 200 to 500. Right. Right. Now all these lenses you're talking about are available in store or online at LondonDrugs.com. Correct. Now we again, I know you just came back from the Olympics yep. and you were busy there, and you have a wealth of knowledge. And we appreciate you taking the time out today and going through these these features that uh, apply just to Nikon or any other camera. And uh, if you want to know more or what lenses we carry or other products, hit our stores. Yep. All our stores, our staff there, our LD experts can help you, and also online. Thanks nice. again, Jay. Thank you, Darren.